Hi everyone, my name is Monique. And I'm Naveen from Before You Play. And today we're going to be showing you how to play the defense of Procyon 3. This one's designed by David Turksey and published by PSC Games, who are helping sponsor this video. And in this game, we're going to be taking on asymmetric factions in a 2v2 style humans versus aliens battle game. That's right. There is a huge war going on on the planet known as Procyon 3 between the humans and a specific alien species. Basically, the humans have found a hidden artifact that is going to be very dangerous to the aliens. Mm -hmm. And of course, the aliens are doing everything that they can to stop them, both on land and in space. Now, this is a highly asymmetric game with a lot of information to discuss. So we're going to start by giving a general overview of how the game is played and then talk about how the boards work in tandem with each other. Mm -hmm. And so if this is your first time playing the game, after the general overview, we recommend jumping directly to the section on your specific faction. And so we're going to include timestamps for all of these sections down below in the description. And I believe that's it. That's it. So yep. without further ado, we are ready to begin. Mm -hmm. So if you please direct your attention to the set of the table, we are all set up here for our 2v2 game of the defense of Procyon 3. Yes. So welcome. This is what it's going to look like once the entire game is set up on the table. Mm -hmm. Just to kind of give you the lay of the land, we technically have two different boards here. The board over here on the right is specifically the land battle. And similarly, the board to the left is the entire battle going on in space. Yep. So when you first set up the game, you're going to want to have it where the humans are on one side and the aliens are on the other. And of course, the ground people are going to be on one side and the space people on the other. And more specifically, that's going to be the alien principal player versus the human expedition player on land and the alien meld player versus the human armada in space. And so the true first order of business is each player needs to select a faction. In general, the aliens are a little bit more offensive and the humans are a lot more defensive. Some roles can also be a little bit more luck-based than others, and so a full description of all four roles can be found on the inside of your main rulebook. In case turn order matters to you, the round will always flow in this sequence. The alien principal will go first, followed by the human armada, then goes the human expedition, and lastly, the alien meld will finish it off. Each player should also have their own personal rule books nearby so that they can easily reference the back of the book, which does a wonderful job outlining all of the different ways that they can earn points, their turn structure, and all the different actions that they can take. Now, the game is played over a maximum of 10 rounds. If you finish the 10th round and nobody has won yet, then at that point, it's going to be whichever team has the most points wins. However, there are three different ways in which the game can end sooner. If one team is able to score 42 points before the end of the 10th round, this triggers the end of the game and the team with the most victory points wins. I do want to mention though that the alien team starts with zero points and the humans actually start the game with 10 victory points. And the reason why the humans have a little bit of a jump to start the game is because of their scientists. Over the course of the game, the humans are going to want to work together to try to get their scientists and safely evacuate them. However, each time the aliens kill a scientist, their scientist token is going to be placed on the morale track, possibly losing the humans' points. If ever a tenth scientist is killed, the aliens immediately win. And lastly, if the aliens are able to successfully bombard the city, then the game ends immediately. But at that point, it's whoever has the most points wins. So it's not an immediate victory like the scientists. And in the case of a tie, the ties are broken in favor of the aliens. Now, we already discussed turn order, and that is never going to change throughout the entire game. In addition, you're only ever going to be fighting on your specific board. Now, there are a few ways in which you can help your partner, but for the most part, these two battles are fairly isolated. Now, if you'll notice, the boards are separated into several different zones. Picture this is kind of the zoomed out version of what's going on on the ground. So we have the Western Hemisphere, which is all these things labeled West. We have the East, and we also have the Central here. And so everything on the Western side corresponds to the Western Hemisphere, everything on the East to the East, and anything in the Central can be either one, East or West. And this is going to be significant when you're working together with your partner to either land ships from space onto the land board or evacuate scientists from the land board into space. In addition to that, there's also buildings on the ground. There's also pylons that are protecting the city from bombardment by the space aliens. And up in space, we have the lunar refinery, which creates Prometheum, which is a valuable resource for the humans, as well as the alien mothership, which is also valuable for the aliens. And that's pretty much the extent of what you need to know in general before deep diving into your specific faction. So at this point, feel free to jump directly to the timestamp that correlates with your faction. And don't worry about making mistakes your first time around. In fact, we recommend playing a practice round where everybody works together to play each role so that everybody's familiar with it. Mm -hmm. And now let's start with the land battle. Starting with the alien principal player, you're going to be taking the first turn of every round, including the start of the game. And your focus is going to be on killing scientists, destroying buildings, knocking out heroes, and getting the empress into the city because each round the empress is there, your team scores five points. 
And the way you're going to go about doing this is by playing command cards from your hand and taking actions, moving your units around the board, and engaging in combat. Some of your components include a deck of command cards, a principal board where you can play directives, and also a bag of cubes, which will be used for combat, which we'll talk about in a little bit. As the principal player, you're gonna be controlling all the purple units that you see on the board. They include legions that have one health point, centurions, which basically act like your muscle, and they have seven health points, and your all-important empress, who contains six health points. You must protect her at all costs. Protect her. <laughs> Now, typically, at the start of each round, the principal player is going to have a hand of four command cards. However, there may be some human effects that will decrease the amount of cards that you actually start your turn with. And on your turn, you're going to be choosing three of these cards from your hand to play and resolve one at a time. Cards are typically discarded after resolving them, but if an effect says to remove a card from play, then the card is out of the game. So let's take a look at the anatomy of a card. When playing a command card, you can take actions using the top half of the card, which corresponds to a specific section or different sections on the board, mm -hmm. or you can use it for the bottom half ability, which is going to range uh, quite a bit. Alternatively, you can choose to ignore all the effects on the card and instead play it face down on top of one of your four directives. So let's start with resolving the top half of the card. When playing a card for its top half location ability, there are three different types of actions that you can take in those specific locations. You can choose to move, you could move and then attack, or if you don't really care to move, you can just choose to attack twice. If you're choosing to only move, you have the option to move up to five units either in or out of the locations depicted on the card. When moving, you must move into or out of adjacent locations. Adjacency is essentially one zone, next to another zone, only divided by a white line. Red lines are not considered adjacent and you must take the long route around. In addition, there is one very important rule when moving that is specific to the alien principal player. And that rule is called suppression. As a principal player, when moving one or more of your units out of a location that also has human units, the human player gets to assign one damage to your leaving units per combat unit they have there. In this example, the principal player is activating the top half of their vents card, allowing them to move units in and out of the western vent location. However, there are already two human units present in that location. Mm -hmm. So if they choose to move all three of their units into an adjacent location, the human player will be allowed to deal two damage, one for each of their units, potentially killing both legions. The good news is scientists do not deal suppressive fire. It's only militias, marines, and heroes. Now, if when activating the top half of your card, you want to also attack, you can choose to move and then attack. But doing this would only allow you to move up to three of your units instead of five. Once all movements are finished, then you would select one location where at least one of your units finished its movement and perform an attack in that location. Now this is where your combat bag with cubes comes into play. When performing an attack, you first have to calculate your attack strength. In order to do this, count the number of units that you have in that location and divide that number by two rounded up. And if over the course of the game, you are able to land a rattle in that same location, which is one of the ships that belongs to the alien meld player, then you get to add plus two to your total strength. Then you randomly draw a number of cubes from your combat bag equal to your strength value. Now you may notice that you have two different colors of cubes in your combat bag. Black cubes are called focus cubes and each one constitutes a successful hit. Whereas white cubes are called discord cubes and each one of these are a miss. And for context, at the start of the game, your combat bag is going to be comprised of 12 focus and 10 discord cubes. Now, over the course of the game, this distribution will change, hopefully for the better. In fact, after resolving battle, some of these cubes will get returned back into your combat bag, depending on how many you've drawn. If you drew only white discord cubes, then one cube will get discarded and the rest are returned back into your bag. If you drew exactly one focus cube and the rest discard, then after resolving battle, all cubes will return to your bag. And basically in any other situation, only one focus cube gets discarded and the rest of the cubes go back into your bag. And as for assigning damage, you as a principal player get to decide how damage is dealt with a couple of exceptions, with the first being absorption fields. Over the course of the game, the human player may choose to build absorption fields in certain locations. If the location that you're attacking in has an absorption field, then it essentially absorbs or removes the first damage cube dealt. But the good news is the absorption field is now also removed from the board because mm -hmm. they are one-time use. It's a one-off. Some locations may also have deflectors, such as in the eastern and western vent to start the game. And if you perform an attack in any of these locations, then the human expedition player gets to assign all damage. But just like the absorption fields, the deflectors are also removed. Otherwise, the main rules for assigning damage are that you must assign damage first to either buildings or human plastic pieces before scientists. And pylons, which are the two main structures on either side of the city, can only be assigned damage once per turn. Whereas buildings can be assigned once per attack. 
Now, anytime you kill militia, marines, or scientists, you're gonna spawn what's called a fallen token in their place. These are gonna be very, very useful in the future because you might have some cards that are gonna allow you to either spawn legions directly from those fallen tokens, or you can score victory points by instilling fear in the humans. Now, both scientists and the 10 militia figures only have one health point, so as soon as you deal a damage, they are removed from the game. Scientists will go onto the morale track and the humans will lose points depending on which number is covered up. As soon as the 10th scientist is placed onto this track, the aliens immediately win. So make that one of your goals. Next, we have the Marines. These are represented by the green pieces that you see on the board. These have a health of two. So if the first time you deal a damage to them, you're gonna lay them down on the side. The second time they are removed and they are out of the game. They go back into the box. Then we have heroes. The human player is gonna have four distinct different heroes and they're all represented by these orange pieces. They're gonna start on different areas of the board and this is always gonna be a fixed setup. And each hero cannot be ever removed from the game, but they can be knocked out by taking a certain amount of wounds. And if you manage to knock out a hero, your team scores four victory points. Heroes, by the way, are a little bit of an exception when dealing damage. The first damage you assign to a hero per round gets ignored. In addition, each hero has a specific number of wound cards that vary depending on the hero. Each time you deal damage to a hero, that specific hero's wound card gets added to the top of the expedition player's deck. If ever you have to deal damage and there are no more wound cards available for that hero, then the hero gets knocked out and you score the four victory points. Now, in addition to enemy units, you can also attack pylons as well as buildings. Pylons are the two structures that can be seen on either side of the city. Each pylon has a total of three health points, one point per token. And the significance of these pylons largely has to do with the alien meld player. As soon as a pylon has been completely destroyed by hitting it three times, then the last token is removed, showing a damaged pylon. And doing so scores your team five points, and this is per pylon. But more importantly, destroying both pylons leaves the city open for the meld to potentially bombard it scoring the alien team eight points and triggering the end of the game. Buildings, on the other hand, can be found in the four different corners of the board, and each one has two health points. The first time one takes a damage, you remove the top tile, and the second time you will flip it over and show a burnt out, destroyed building. Mm -hmm. When doing this, you are going to immediately construct, as a free action, a sky beam. For every sky beam that is present on the board, including the one that you just placed, you're going to score one victory point. And that is upon building a sky beam. Correct. So in the future, if you built a third sky beam, that's going to be three points. Mm -hmm. Sky beams have to do more with the meld player, so we recommend working together with them. And as for the buildings, we recommend familiarizing yourself with what each one of them do, especially the jam which adds discord cubes to your combat bag. Mm -hmm. Now these sky beams are not permanent. You must protect them because every time one of these gets destroyed, the humans will score two points. The third and final option for resolving the top half of your card is the ability to just attack twice. Doing so does not allow you to move like in the other two options, but it does allow you to attack twice in the depicted location. And if there are several locations, then you can kind of mix and match which two to attack. And so to review, when playing a card from your hand to resolve its top half action, you can use it to either move, move and attack, or just attack twice. Alternatively, you can play a card for its bottom half ability, and these are going to vary from card to card, so just follow the instructions on the card itself. Some cards will allow you to place additional centurions because you do have five of them, but only three of them to start the game. Some allow you to recover health, some allow you to remove deflectors and absorption fields, and of course, others allow you to spawn from a fallen. When spawning, you must choose to either spawn a legion unit, placing it in place of the fallen token, or you can spawn a critter, instilling fear in the general area, which will then score you one victory point. And finally, the last option when playing a card from your hand is you can completely ignore the card itself and instead choose one of the four directives on your player board to resolve. If you'll notice, your player board is divided into four different columns. These are your directives that contain two possible types of actions. The first time you activate a directive, you resolve both actions from top to bottom. You then cover up the top action, placing your chosen command card face down. In the future, if you choose to activate that specific directive again, only the bottom action is now available to you. And at that point, after resolving that action, you would then cover up that action as well with a command card. That directive will no longer be available until the first time you completely deplete your draw deck. This triggers rejuvenation, which allows you to clear your directives and shuffle your discard pile. But please keep in mind that you can only reset your directives board once per game. At the end of your turn, simply draw your hand back up to four cards. Now just a couple of things to keep in mind about the human expedition player. The expedition player will only be able to activate one hero per round. So just keep that in mind when you're strategizing where to place your units. 
In addition, the human expedition player is most likely going to try really hard to destroy your empress. So get your empress into the city, sit in there so that you can earn 5 points per round and protect her at all costs. And finally, the scientists. In order for the human player to evacuate the scientists off the planet, they need to bring them to a protected location, which is going to be to either one of the two pylons or to the city center. Keep that in mind so that you can track where the scientists are probably going to be going. And for more specific strategy advice, please refer to page 19 of your rulebook under Considering Your Opponent. And as for your alien meld partner in space, there are going to be a few opportunities throughout the game where you can help each other. Namely, the human meld player may be able to land rattles onto the board to increase your battle strength, while you have the ability to potentially create spores and reset their neuron dice. At this point, the turn order would proceed to the human armada player in space, but for now, we're going to jump directly to the human expedition player. Human Expedition player, you'll be going third in turn order right after the Armada player, which means once the principal player is done with their turn, you should start thinking about yours since the board state largely will not change. As a Human Expedition, your main focus will be to help protect and evacuate scientists and kill the Empress if you can. And the way in which you're going to go about doing this is by activating one of your four heroes each round, potentially utilizing their special ability, and playing tactics cards to take actions, such as moving around the board, engaging in combat, and activating one of four different buildings with their unique benefits for you to use, at least until they've been destroyed by the aliens. Remember, each time a scientist is killed, you'll potentially lose points, and if a tenth scientist is ever killed, you will lose the game immediately. So you must protect them and get them off the planet. Some of your components include a deck of tactics cards, wound cards, and an expedition board with slots for each of your four heroes. In addition to your four heroes whose health points vary, you will also be controlling marines who have two health points, as well as militias and scientists who each have one health point. Now your turn consists of four phases. Each round, you'll start your turn with the activation phase by optionally playing one tactics card from your hand in order to activate one of your four heroes. So let's take a look at the anatomy of a tactics card. Each card corresponds to a specific hero to be activated, as well as its effect listed below. You'll also notice symbols at the top left-hand corner. Ignore these for now, as we will be discussing them during the next phase. When playing a card, place an activation token next to your hero to indicate that they are active for the round. Now keep in mind that playing a card during this phase is always optional, but once the card effect has been resolved, you discard it to the exhausted tactics pile of your player board. Cards placed here are completely out of the game. After you continue into the momentum phase, we are allowed to play up to two tactics cards utilizing the momentum and power symbols in the top left corner to take different actions. Flag symbols, also known as momentum, allow you to take various actions, while the lightning bolt symbols, also known as power, allow you to activate building abilities. There are four different types of actions you can take using momentum. For each momentum symbol on your played tactics cards, you can choose to move, attack, or place a deflector token. To move a unit or hero, you spend one momentum to simply move them to an adjacent location, keeping in mind that red lines are not passable. This action will be very important when evacuating scientists. As for attacking, you can spend one momentum per unit anywhere on the board to deal exactly one hit point. But it's important to keep in mind that each unit can only attack once per round. Scientists cannot attack, and only the activated hero can attack each round. For each hit point, place a red hit cube in the corresponding location of the attack. We'll resolve all enemy damage during your cleanup phase, which we'll talk about later. As for your enemy, they'll have three main types of units you can attack. Legions that have one health point, Centurions with 7 health, and the Soul Empress who has 6 health points. Killing a Centurion will score your team 3 points, while killing the Empress scores you 10. In addition, over the course of the game, the aliens may construct sky beams by destroying your buildings. Each sky beam has a health of 2 hit points, but each one you destroy will score your team 2 victory points. And all of this information, including enemy health points and yours and your opponent's objectives, are included on the back of your rulebook. The last action you can take by spending one momentum is called regrouping. And it allows you to place a deflector and or remove a fallen token from a location with at least one hero present. What's really nice about deflectors is they allow you the advantage of being able to assign your own damage on the principal player's turn. They are a one-time use, but can be very useful. Fallen tokens are placed on the board each time one of your scientists, militia, or marines are killed by the principal player. These tokens allow them to spawn more units or score points, so removing them from the board is also very helpful. Now, if your tactics card shows at least one power symbol, you can spend it to activate a building ability, but this action can only be taken once per round. 
And keep in mind that these building abilities are only available to you until the building's been destroyed. So let's briefly discuss them. First, we have the hospital. And this building allows you to remove wound cards from your deck, which we'll discuss later. The railgun, which is down here, allows you to kill one legion anywhere on the board. The comms array, which is down here, allows you to gain one echo drone, which you'll be able to spend in the next phase. And lastly, we have the jammer. The jammer allows you to add one discord cube to the principal player's combat bag, and this increases their chances of missing when attacking you. In addition to these four actions, if you had activated a hero in the previous phase, you can also use the special ability known as their heroic feat, which is listed on their hero card. Unlike the previous four actions, this, however, does not cost anything. Most of the hero abilities are pretty straightforward, though one of Dr. Cram's abilities allows you to add an absorption field to the board. These tokens cancel the first damage dealt by the principal player in that location and are removed after use. And all these actions, including the hero ability, can be taken in any order, as long as you fully resolve one action before moving on to the next. Once all actions have been resolved, then you move on to the drone phase, where you can spend up to two Echo Drones to either launch a scientist into space or drop a marine from a frigate, which is one of the Armada ships. Echo Drones, by the way, are tokens that you'll be sharing with the Armada player. So make sure you communicate with them whenever you need to use them. Scientists can only be launched from one of the two pylons or from the city, which means that in the previous phase, you should have moved a scientist into that zone to get him out. To launch a scientist, spend one Echo Drone and move its token to the sub-orbit zone on the spaceboard that is adjacent to the location you're launching from. Once the scientist has been launched into space, flip over the token to show the transport ship, place two Prometheum crystals underneath, and finally, the Armada player may immediately make a free move. At this point, the scientist is out of your hands and it's now up to the Armada player to keep them safe. Alternatively, if there's at least one Armada frigate in orbit, you can spend one Echo Drone to add one Marine from your reserve to an adjacent land location, then immediately deal one hit with them. Once this phase is over, move to cleanup. Finally, during this phase, you convert all of your hit points to damage. To do this, you're going to fully resolve each location with hit cubes one by one by alternating with the principal player and assigning damage to enemy units. This means the principal player gets to decide half of the damage, but you always get to choose first per location. And once all locations have been resolved, you finally end your turn by drawing up to four cards. If your draw deck is ever empty, do not shuffle your discard. Instead, flip it over and continue drawing. Now here are a few things to keep in mind about the alien principal player. During their turn, they'll be adding wound cards to the top of your draw deck whenever they deal damage to your heroes. On your turn, you can play these wound cards as normal, but they don't provide any special abilities or let you take any actions. Mm -hmm. So they'll essentially be slowing you down by clogging up your hand. In addition, the principal player may try to bring their empress into the city, because every round the empress is there, they score 5 points. And so one rule you can use to your advantage is called suppression. Each time an enemy unit attempts to leave a location where you have non-scientist units, you immediately deal one damage for each of your units there. And aliens must attack all of the units and structures before your scientists, so protect them with your plastic pieces. And for more strategy advice, turn to page 19 in your rulebook under Considering Your Opponent. And as for your human armada partner in space, make sure you coordinate specifically the right timing as to when to evacuate the scientist, because this timing is super important. In addition, keep in mind that your echo drones are a shared supply, so make sure you communicate properly as to when you want to spend them. At this point, turn proceeds to the alien meld player, but we're going to rewind a little bit and talk about the human armada player in space. Human Armada player, you'll be taking the second turn of the game right after the alien principal player. But seeing as the principal player's turn will likely not affect you, you can start thinking about your turn right at the start of the game. As the Armada, your main focus will be on transporting scientists to safety and destroying alien meld units, which are all of these purple pieces on the board, including their mothership. To do this, you'll be playing a tactic card each round that'll activate your units and provide technologies that'll change from round to round. Some of your components include your Armada player board and a deck of tactics cards, as well as three different types of ships, interceptors, frigates, and dreadnoughts. Now, before we talk about turn structure, let's take a look at the anatomy of a tactics card. Tactics cards are divided into three different sections. The topmost, which you'll be using to activate units on your turn. The middle area, that describes a technology that'll become active whenever this card is at the top of your discard pile. And the bottom section, which will only be used to calculate damage dealt when using the tactics card as a part of your combat deck. During setup and after rounds 2, 5, and 8, you'll be adding cards to your combat deck by drawing 6 and choosing 3 to shuffle into your deck, 
while the other three go into your hand to play during your turn. Now your turn consists of four distinct phases, starting with the Prometheum phase. Prometheum is a resource you'll be able to spend in a variety of ways, depending on what your cards say. Each round, you'll start your turn by harvesting Prometheum from two possible sources. As long as your Lunar Refinery is still intact, you harvest one Prometheum token from the supply each round. If during this phase, there's a Scientist Transport token in the same zone as one of your Frigates or Dreadnoughts, you gain the two Prometheum from the Transport token. We'll discuss saving Scientists later. Then you move on to the Tactics phase, where you can choose to play one card from your hand or take two coordinate actions, which we'll explain later. When you play a card, you then activate the combination of ships shown at the top in any order. Now when playing Tactics cards, keep in mind that you won't gain additional cards into your hand until the end of the 2nd, 5th, and 8th rounds, so plan your cards accordingly. Also, each ship can only be activated once, so use a marker to indicate this, but unlike the Meld player, they can be from any zones. Activating a ship allows you to take actions depending on its type. Interceptors are your smallest but relatively fast combat unit. They allow you to take up to two actions when activating, and for each action, you can choose to either move or attack in close combat, but you cannot attack twice. Now, movement works the same way for all units. It allows you to move to an adjacent zone, keeping in mind that zones separated by red lines are not considered adjacent. But for example, a ship in a zone like this one would be adjacent to multiple zones, all separated by the white lines. And as for combat, interceptors can only participate in close combat, which means targeting and attacking an enemy unit that is in the same zone as the interceptor. Now let's talk about your combat deck. Anytime you choose to attack an enemy unit, you draw the top card of your combat deck to determine the damage. And keep in mind that in order to kill an enemy unit, you have to deal enough hit points in one round to defeat them or else all damage resets. Now if you run out of cards in your combat deck and need to draw more, you basically reshuffle your discard. This means if you can remember the attack strength of some of the cards in your combat deck, then you can kind of predict the outcome of some of your battles. As for your enemy, they have four main type of combat units that you can attack, including rattles and fangs that each require two hits, hoods that need three, and Cobras with four hit points. Killing specifically a Cobra will score your team three victory points. And as for the other types of ships, you score two points for every two enemy ships you kill in one round. Including the Cobra. That's right. In addition to combat units, you can also destroy the Mothership, which is a structure that acts like a non-mobile Cobra for the enemy team. It has five health and destroying it will earn your team six victory points. Now back to Interceptors. Interceptors have a special ability that allows them to deal one additional damage when attacking specifically hoods. Now in addition to close combat, other units such as frigates can also participate in range combat, which allows them to target and attack enemy units in adjacent zones. When activating a frigate, just like the Interceptors, you can choose to take up to two actions, choosing to either move or participate in combat, either close or ranged for each action, but you cannot choose to do range combat twice. And finally, the Dreadnoughts. These units are slow, but very powerful. Activating them allows you to move and deploy an interceptor or go into combat, which means they cannot both move and attack in the same turn. When choosing to move your Dreadnought, these interceptors come from your supply and they get deployed into the same zone that the Dreadnought is now in. This is really the only way for you to gain more ships because once your ships are destroyed by the meld, they're out of the game. And by the way, interceptors that are deployed this way can also be activated this turn. Now in participating in combat, Dreadnoughts are quite powerful because they deal one additional damage for ranged combat and two additional damage for close combat. In addition to that, whenever you activate your Dreadnought, you can end your activation by performing a fleet movement, which allows you to move up to two frigates or interceptors once each as long as neither of them have been activated this turn. So your Dreadnought is definitely going to be your most powerful unit. Your last type of unit are the Scientist Transports. One of your main goals as a human team is to save the scientists. So you must work together with a human expedition player to complete their journey to safety. The human expedition player will be attempting to evacuate scientists into suborbit during their turn. Once a scientist transport is in suborbit, which is this region over here directly above the planet, you'll only have one turn to get the scientist transport into orbit or else they'll die. In order to move your scientist transport tokens, you have to sacrifice one of the activations during your turn. In this example, instead of activating five of my interceptors, I can instead activate four of them and spend my fifth activation on the scientist transport token, moving it to one adjacent zone. Unfortunately, these transport tokens are very slow and can only move one space per round. And as soon as you're able to move it out of orbit, which as a reminder is only this ring over here, 
then the transport token will immediately jump, saving the scientist and scoring your team three victory points. Remember, this will take at least two turns to do. But if there are multiple transports in space, you can replace multiple activations with transport movements, moving them one space each. And lastly, each transport launches into space carrying two Prometheum tokens. If ever you start your turn with at least one frigate or dreadnought in the same zone as the transport, you gain the Prometheum. Now the last type of activation you'll see at the top of your cards are called coordinate actions. Each coordinate action gains you one echo drone that you can use during the next phase. In fact, during this phase, instead of playing a card from your hand, you can choose to take two coordinate actions to gain Echo Drones. Doing so means you don't play any cards from your hand, but at the end of your turn, you get to rearrange your discard pile, which will be very important when considering your active technology, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Once all actions have been resolved, then you move on to the drone phase, where you can spend up to two Echo Drones to either remove a Spore Cloud or perform a Ground Strike. Echo Drones are shared by you and the Human Expedition player, so make sure you communicate with them whenever you want to spend them. Spore Clouds are the main ways in which the Alien Meld player attacks your units. Each of your units has a certain number of shields, and as soon as a zone has an equal number of spores or greater than your unit's shield value, the Meld player can torpedo your unit and eliminate it. Spending one Echo Drone allows you to remove one Spore Cloud in a zone with a Dreadnought or a Frigate present. Ground strikes are performed by at least one dreadnought in orbit and affect any one adjacent ground location on the land board that has a hero in it. Doing this requires you to flip a combat card to determine the amount of damage. Communicate with the expedition player to make sure it's the right time to attack. Once this phase is over, you end your turn by discarding your tactic card face up on top of your discard pile. This card is now your current technology, and anything written in text will be in effect until the end of your next turn when you discard a new card. And make sure you notify all players around the table about what your new technology is. At this point, any scientist transports that are still in suborbit are destroyed. You place them on the morale track, and you lose victory points accordingly. And remember, if this is the 10 scientists killed, your team loses immediately. So make sure you get them out of suborbit. Now just a few things to keep in mind about the alien meld player. Just like the Armada, the meld faction also has several different types of units that interact in certain ways, sometimes strengthening their own ships in adjacent zones, or by making it so that your ships are unable to perform ranged combat. So make sure you're familiar with the different types of ships and how they interact with each other. And of course, try to eliminate Cobras, because they score you points. Also, make sure you're aware of how many spores are present in each zone at any given time. Spores stay in the zones that they're created in, so moving your ships out of these zones fully restores your shields. And also keep in mind that they may also choose to create spores in the same zone as a lunar refinery in order to destroy it and cut off your supply of Prometheum. And for additional strategy advice, turn to page 20 in your rulebook under Considering Your Opponent. And as for the human expedition player on land, your frigates can drop marines from orbit during their turn. So you'll want to communicate with them in order to do this. And of course, coordinate the scientists getting off that planet so you can get them to safety. At this point, turn proceeds to the human expedition player. But we're going to jump straight to the alien meld player in space to finish out the round. Alien meld player, you'll be going last in turn order right after the human expedition player. Which means, once the armada has finished their turn, you should start thinking about yours, because the board state largely will not change. As the alien meld, your main focus will be on eliminating scientists and destroying the armada's ships. And you'll do this by creating spores to weaken their shields and firing torpedoes to eliminate them. You'll have a host of different ships at your fingertips, as well as the ability to make more. Some of your components include your alien meld board, a deck of command cards and evolved command cards, six neuron dice, as well as four types of ships, fangs, rattles, hoods, and of course, cobras. And you can distinguish them from your enemies by their purple color. During your turn, you'll be choosing two command cards from your hand to play, as well as one neuron die from your supply. If at the start of your turn, you have no neuron dice available, you get to reroll them all, but you also lose two victory points. And doing so gains the humans one Echo Drone. Otherwise, if you still have dice available at the start of your turn, you get to construct a small ship, which is specifically a fang, a hood, or a rattle. Basically anything that's not a cobra. Mm -hmm. Whenever you construct small ships, they're placed in the same zone as a cobra or the mothership as long as it's still intact. Certain actions on your turn may allow you to construct a cobra, which is a combination of all three types of small ships. When creating a Cobra, you return one of each type of ship all from the same zone back to your supply and put a Cobra in their place. Next, after constructing a ship, for every sky beam that's present on the ground board, place one function cube in a zone that's either adjacent in orbit or above orbit that also has a meld ship. 
So if the sky beam were on the western side of the map, then you can place a function cube in either of these zones since your meld chips are also present there. Placing function cubes onto the board increases the number of zones that you'll be able to activate ships in, as you'll see. Afterwards, select one available neuron die and two zones that have at least one of your ships present. In addition to the function cubes that you earn from the sky beams, these are the only two zones that you'll be able to activate ships in this round. And the number of ships that you can activate in each zone is dependent on the neuron die that you chose. Each filled-in diamond icon grants you one ship activation per zone, including the ones with the function cubes provided by the sky beams. Then you're going to choose exactly two cards from your hand and fully resolve the top half ability of one card, then the bottom half ability of the other. The top half of the card dictates which types of ships you're allowed to activate in each zone. For example, this card allows me to activate hoods and cobras during this round. You may then activate each ship one by one, removing each function cube as you resolve their actions. And if there are no more valid ships to activate, any leftover function cubes are wasted. Actions you can take when activating ships include moving them to adjacent zones, creating spore clouds, and torpedoing enemy ships whose shields have been fully exhausted. The way that your combat works is very unique. The human armada player will have three different types of combat ships that you can attack. Interceptors with three shields, frigates with five shields, and dreadnoughts who have nine shields. Destroying a dreadnought, which are the orange ships, will score you nine victory points. A frigate, three victory points, and you will also score one victory point for every second enemy ship you destroyed in one round. When activating your ships, you'll be able to place spores that will lower the shields of all enemy units in the same zone by one for every spore present in that zone. And as soon as the number of spores are equal to or greater than the shield value of one of your enemy ships in the same zone, your ships can torpedo them, removing them from the board. In addition to their standard combat ships, the human armada will also be attempting to evacuate scientist transport ships on their turn, and these ships only have one shield. Eliminating these scientist transports are one of your main goals, because if you're ever able to eliminate 10 scientists, then your team wins immediately. However, scientist transports can only be torpedoed if there are no other enemy combat units left in its zone. In addition to their ships, the Armada also has a structure called the Lunar Refinery that has six shields and is destroyed in the same way as their ships. Destroying the Lunar Refinery cuts off their main source of Promethium, which is a resource they use to take certain actions and will score your team six victory points. Now as an alien meld player, there are four types of ships that you have available to you and they each have special abilities. It'll be advantageous for you to become familiar with them. Fangs are your main fighter ships. Activating a fang allows you to either move it to an adjacent zone, then place one spore cloud, or move, then torpedo an enemy unit. All movement when activating ships is completely optional, and when torpedoing ships, one spore cloud from its zone is also removed. Rattles, when activated, can either move twice, or move once and bring another small ship with it. Each rattle also doubles exactly one spore cloud in its zone. And if there are multiple rattles in a zone, they each double a different spore cloud. Rattles can also be landed by the alien principal player, increasing their combat strength during their turn. Make sure you communicate with your partner about when to do this. Activating a hood allows you to move and then torpedo a ship in the same zone. Hoods are particularly effective because they provide one additional health to all meld ships in adjacent zones. And these effects stack if multiple hoods are present. In this example, this fang is adjacent to three different hoods. So as long as this stays true, all ships in this zone will have three additional health. It's important to note that hoods do not provide additional health to ships in their zone, only in those adjacent. Ships that are in the same zone as a hood, just like this frigate over here, cannot perform ranged combat. And so as you can see, hoods can be very powerful when placed in strategic positions. And finally, your cobras. Activating a cobra allows you to take three actions. And for each action, you can choose to move the cobra once, create a spore cloud in its zone or an adjacent one, or torpedo a ship in its zone or an adjacent one. Once you fully resolve the top effect of one card, go ahead and discard it and then resolve the bottom effect of the other card. These effects will vary depending on the card played, but one of the main effects you'll see is called bombardment. This allows you to deal damage directly to units on the land board that are in the zones adjacent to your ship. Keep in mind that when resolving this action, you're not allowed to deal damage to both the eastern and western side in the same action. And only a maximum of one scientist can be targeted as long as all other non-scientist units have been targeted first. As soon as both pylons are completely destroyed, the city is no longer protected. And dealing at least one damage to any human unit present in the city will also destroy the artifact, which would trigger the end game and score your team 8 victory points. Other bottom card effects include constructing additional ships, teleporting between hoods, 
retrieving your Neuron dice, and even evolving one of your command cards to one of the four face-up cards on your meldboard, swapping it with either a basic card from your hand or discarded area. And any effects that require a number of circular icons pertains to the circles on the Neuron die you selected for the round. For example, if I had chosen this Neuron die with two empty circles, the bottom effect of this card called Automated Construction says I can construct one hood, one rattle, and the number of fangs equal to the number of empty circles, which is two. And once you're finished resolving the bottom effect, discard the card and remove any leftover function cubes and all activation tokens from the board, and end your turn by discarding your Neuron die. And at this point, if you no longer have command cards in your hand, you pick up your discard pile. Now just a few things to keep in mind about the Human Armada player. Some of their ships can only perform close combat in the same zone, and others can do ranged in adjacent zones. It's important to know the limitations of each when strategizing where to move your ships. And keep in mind that their ships can be quite powerful, but they also rely on their custom combat deck to determine the damage amount. And unlike you, they can't rebuild their ships. They can only deploy interceptors, but once their frigates and dreadnoughts have been destroyed, they're out of the game. As for the scientists, the Armada player can only move each scientist transport to one adjacent zone per round, and the transport only jumps as soon as it moves into a non-orbit zone. Use this information to your advantage when targeting scientists. And for additional strategy advice, turn to page 17 in your rulebook under Considering Your Opponent. And as for your alien principal partner on land, there may be a moment where landing a rattle from space can be very advantageous to them on the ground. And in turn, they can help you reset some of your neuron dice, which can be very valuable. In addition, they should notify you whenever they construct a sky beam, since these sky beams allow you to activate other ships in other zones. And if both pylons have been completely destroyed, you can now bombard the city. So make sure you communicate openly for these opportunities. And once your turn is over, make sure you move the round tracker because it is now the end of the round. If this is the end of the 10th round, the game is now over and whoever has the most points wins. Otherwise, begin the next round starting again with the principal player. And there you have it. That is how you play each faction in the Defense of Procyon 3. At this point, you should now be able to get started with your first game. Keep in mind that there are some additional advanced rules that we did not discuss during this teach, and for any additional clarification, please refer to your individual rulebooks. And don't forget to refer to the back of your specific rulebook for a nice quick summary of everything we discussed. And if you want to see a one-round demonstration of how this game is exactly played, you can check out the link that's up here. There's also going to be one in the description down below. So thank you so much for watching the video. We hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments down below, and we'll try to get back to them as soon as possible. Thank you so much for watching. Bye! Bye.